Welcome back to the world of Ikerd, where we learn how to think like the College Board. Today we're covering topics 8.5 and 8.6. Here's the required content for 8.5 decolonization. Nationalist leaders in Asia and Africa sought autonomy. And finally in 8.5 we see independence movements that successfully ended European imperialism. This next part tells us that there were a variety of ways these nationalist movements achieved independence, including through negotiation and through armed struggle. You should know some examples for each. Let's look at some examples. Starting in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist leader who had been fighting for independence since at least the end of World War I. Ho Chi Minh's forces, the Viet Minh, resisted both French and Japanese imperialism, making Vietnam also a good example of armed struggle to achieve independence. And we already saw in 8.3 how Vietnam was also the site of two Cold War proxy wars. Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh are very useful information for understanding Unit 8. Another example of independence achieved through armed struggle was the Algerian War of Independence, where the Algerian National Liberation Front fought against French imperialism, gaining independence in 1962. It can also be seen as a proxy war, since the Soviet Union provided financial support to the FLN as part of its goal to weaken NATO members such as France. Next, let's look at Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah. Ghana had been under British control since 1821 under the Gold Coast Colony. Kwame Nkrumah established the Convention People's Party in 1949, which sought complete independence from British rule. Nkrumah is an example of independence achieved through negotiation, since his philosophy of positive action included political agitation, newspaper and educational campaigns, and if necessary, the use of strikes, boycotts, and non-cooperation, all strictly non-violent. Ghana achieved independence in 1957, with Nkrumah as its first prime minister. We already saw in Topic 8.2 how he was also an important leader in the non-aligned movement, and his promotion of pan-Africanism. Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah are also very good to know. Another example of negotiated independence was British India, which was achieved using non-violent resistance through the leadership of Mohandas Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru and the Indian National Congress. We've seen the Indian National Congress in Units 6 and 7 already. Nehru was an example of the non-aligned movement in 8.2, and the results of Indian independence are required content in Topic 8.6, and Gandhi himself is required in 8.7. So the College Board clearly wants you to know about India. Now Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, another nationalist leader in Africa who took power in 1952. Egypt actually had gained independence in 1922, but was led by King Farouk, widely considered a corrupt puppet of the British Empire. Nasser's nationalist approach sought to eliminate foreign influence, most famously nationalizing the Suez Canal in 1956. There are literally dozens more of successful decolonization movements throughout Africa and Asia in the second half of the 20th century, each with their own complex and fascinating story. Fortunately, you don't need to know them all, but you should know that by the end of the 20th century, Africa and Asia were no longer under European domination and were instead independent nation states. But that's not to say that they all lived happily ever after. As we see in the last part of Topic 8.5. Regional, religious, and ethnic movements challenged colonial rule and inherited imperial boundaries. Some of these movements advocated for autonomy. When Europeans divided up Africa and Asia among themselves in the days of Unit 6, the borders they created served their own interests of resource extraction, trade, and imperialistic rivalries. These borders often completely disregarded ethnic and religious diversity as well as historical regional politics. So when these territories began to decolonize, the resulting independent states inherited many problems. A good example of this was the Biafran separatist movement in Nigeria, independent from British rule in 1960. This new nation of Nigeria had four main ethnic groups, Hausa and Fulani in the north, Yoruba in the west, and Igbo in the east. The Igbo felt that they were being sidelined and underrepresented in the new nation. In 1967, they attempted to create their own separate country, the Republic of Biafra. This led to a brutal civil war that claimed the lives of at least three million Igbo civilians from the ensuing famine. The separatist movement was unsuccessful, and ethnic tensions remained a major part of Nigerian politics and society. Another example was the Muslim League in British India, where religious divisions began appearing even before decolonization. The Muslim League was founded in 1906 to advocate for the rights and representation of the large Muslim minority in British India, concerned by the dominance of the Hindu majority in the Indian National Congress. In 1940, the Muslim League issued the Lahore Resolution, which proposed independent states in areas where there were Muslim majorities. The resulting partition of India is required content for our next topic, so let's move on to that. Topic 8.6, Newly Independent States. Here's the first part. The redrawing of political boundaries after the withdrawal of formal colonial authorities led to the creation of new states. Pretty self-explanatory and something we've already covered. Ghana, Nigeria, North and South Korea, Vietnam, Algeria, etc. The second part is more specific. The redrawing of political boundaries in some cases led to conflict as well as population displacement and or resettlements, including those related to the partition of India and the creation of the state of Israel. Let's start with the partition of India, which begins with our discussion of the Muslim League in Topic 8.5. 
1995, Muhammad Ali Jinnah became a leading figure of the league and increasingly advocated for an independent Muslim nation state, separate from the Hindu majority Pakistan. There were also Hindu nationalists that wanted the Hindus to dominate the new country. Although the leaders Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru advocated for a unified nation governed along secular lines. In the end, it was agreed to divide India into two separate countries, a Hindu majority India and a Muslim majority Pakistan, which included two separate territories in the northwest and in the east. As it became clear that independence was imminent, tensions between Hindus and Muslims began escalating, and the British were eager to get out of India before they could be blamed for any problems that resulted. So the partition of India was rushed through quickly, creating widespread unease and confusion. Millions of Sikhs and Hindus in what is now Pakistan quickly migrated to the new state of India, and Muslims from India migrated to Pakistan. This caused violence, displacement, and permanent separation of many families. And India and Pakistan today remain bitter rivals that have frequent conflicts with each other. Next, we have to talk about the creation of Israel. The story begins with the birth of Zionism, a nationalism for Jewish people that began in the 19th century with Theodore Herzl, who argued in his 1896 book, The Jewish State, that the only way to ensure the safety of Jews was for them to have their own nation state, since their status as ethnic minorities throughout Europe and the Ottoman Empire left them vulnerable to persecution. The British gained control of Palestine after World War I as a League of Nations mandate, which we discussed in Topic 7.5. In 1917, the British government issued the Balfour Declaration, promising to create a national Jewish home and soon allowed Jewish settlers into Palestine. After the Holocaust, in which six million Jews were murdered in Europe, many in the international community agreed with the Zionist argument that Jews needed their own national home to be safe, and the United Nations approved the creation of Israel in 1948. But the creation of this new home meant that many Muslim Palestinians lost theirs. Furthermore, many Arab nations nearby rejected this new state, leading to the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, in which Israel emerged victorious and which caused further displacement of Muslim Palestinians. These problems continue to affect the region. The last sections of 8.6 are about economics. Let's start here. Governments often took on a strong role in guiding economic life to promote development. One example is Nasser in Egypt. We already mentioned his nationalization of the Suez Canal. He also encouraged industrialization and the formation of state-owned enterprises. His economic policies also included land reform, with land from the wealthy being redistributed to the peasants. This was popular with the peasants and also undermined the role of traditional economic elites. Nasser was also a leading figure of the non-aligned movement, so he can count for 8.2, 8.4, 8.5, and 8.6. So Nasser is also clearly a good guy for you to know. Another example is Indira Gandhi, the third prime minister of India. No relation to Mohandas Gandhi, but actually the daughter of Nehru. Indira Gandhi's use of the government to guide public life included the nationalization of major banks in 1969, as well as government investments into the Green Revolution in India. With new genetically modified strains of rice and wheat that produced higher yields and increased the food supply. We'll talk more about the Green Revolution in Unit 9. Finally, we have this. The migration of former colonial subjects to imperial metropoles, the former colonizing country, usually in the major cities, maintained cultural and economic ties between the colony and the metropole, even after the dissolution of empires. So even though decolonization meant a severing of the political ties between the colonized and the metropole, the cultural and economic ties remained. Culturally, that includes language, religion, and other customs. Economically, it meant a continuation of trade routes and international business. Many people from Algeria learned French. People in India speak English. So many migrated, going to the UK or France for university or seeking job opportunities. Many of these people migrated temporarily to save money to send back home, called remittances. Many others chose to migrate permanently. That's it for now. We'll see you next time to talk about global resistance to established power structures and the end of the Cold War.